as we get into our uh, message for today, today is Shabbat HaGadol, the great Shabbat, uh, and it has a special meaning, uh, and we, we, we touch upon that every year, uh, the Shabbat just before Passover. And so we'll be touching upon it, but I have to just say that I came to faith in the Messiah uh, because of the Tanakh, because of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, because of Isaiah 53 in particular. Uh, and so when I came to faith, I had never read uh, the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, the New Testament, as it's also called. I'd never read it. And when I came to faith and, and I, I started reading it, I was surprised about a couple of things. First of all, what a Jewish book. I was so, I was, I was surprised, I was shocked. To tell you the truth, I was surprised at how Jewish a book it is, and we'll be touching upon some of that uh, this morning. Uh, but even beyond that, I was surprised at how many people who uh, purportedly love uh, the Bible and love uh, the Messiah, they call him Christ, etc., but still, how many of them did not know it was such a Jewish book? I was kind of surprised by that. How could they not see it? Uh, and so very early on, I, I, I got my, myself kind of understanding uh, that looking at the book uh, needs to be done through Jewish eyes. Uh, it was written uh, in the Jewish frame of reference. Uh, it, was due, it was written in light of the Jewish promises that are fulfilled in the Jewish Messiah. For all people, certainly. But that's the context. And the text taken out of its context has become a pretext. Uh, for all kinds of miserable subtext. So as we consider this portion now, we need to look at it through a different set of eyes. If you're visiting with us or live streaming uh, from where your, where your churches may look at these matters, uh, we want to look at it uh, in light of the context Messiah presented in. Uh, please stand, if you will. Uh, it'll be the last standing you get for a little while. As we read this uh, one slide of scripture together in unison and out loud, here we go. And then came the first day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Yeshua sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover rut, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them. And they... Just a emphasize the theme in this section, you'll notice how often the word prepare is repeated uh, in this sh short portion of scripture. Understand the importance of preparation as we now come before the Lord. Let's bring him the upper room of our souls accordingly. Uh, Avinu, our Father, we throw thankful for your love for us uh, for the good news that you presented, provided for us, that in Messiah, uh, the Lamb of God, uh, that you have provided a full, complete, and perfect salvation so that we might not merely know about you, but know you, that we might not just be hearers, but able to be involved in participating in the life of God, and so we pray for our preparation even now. May Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, minister in our souls, uh, that we might be prepared to hear what you have to say through your word. Uh, I pray that Ruach HaKodesh would take my, my meager, frail words and make it into good news for our souls. Give the increase, we pray, to the end that Yeshua is exalted, lifted up, and magnified. For it's in his matchless name that we pray. Amen, amen. Please be seated, if you will. And so as we consider this matter of preparation, uh, what you are preparing for reveals your faith. Your faith is revealed in what you are preparing or anticipating in life. And so for most of us who uh, trust the weatherman, 
uh, and looking out the window, we brought an umbrella with us so we might be prepared, as we saw Noah floating by this morning, uh, but nonetheless. Uh, and so we find also couples who get a prenup. Uh, they are preparing for divorce, not for the marriage, not at all. Uh, life insurance, you're, you're prepared for your big exodus uh, as, the, as the matter is. Uh, people prepare for all sorts of things, old age, tornadoes, pandemics, uh, trusting in Yeshua is what prepares you for eternity. So the Bible, in light of what we're studying, instructs us to be prepared for Passover uh, and that through the Passover, being prepared not only for Passover, being prepared so that through the Passover, we understand the eternal elements and prepare that much more for heaven itself and the fellowship we have with our God. And so we understand Passover, we understand that God was not merely delivering us from bondage in Egypt, but he was delivering us so we could have a relationship with him. Uh, and so that's the purpose of our freedom accordingly. And so there's very little attention that Passover gets in many quarters. Uh, so it's, un it's interesting, as I mentioned to you when I first read the New Covenant, uh, how often Messiah spoke about preparing for the Passover. Uh, Yeshua taught us, uh, and quite well and often, that the Passover lamb, that he himself as the lamb, that he is our Passover, that this pictures our spiritual relationship uh, with the Lord our God, uh, and that we can have no greater participation without having proper preparation. Some of us are not going to get much out of a service. We're not going to get much out of Passover uh, if our hearts are not properly prepared for what the Lord wants to do. Growing up, of course, I, I grew up uh, in an observant home, a traditional Jewish home, uh, and the Passover Seder was very long. And most of my participation was begging Zeta, uh, Zeta, quicker, quick, you got a quick, quick, let's eat already. Uh, that's why mostly my participation, uh, you can tell what my preparation was all about. And so we want to understand the issue of the relationship between our preparation and therefore our participation in the very life of God, in the very truth of God. And so preparing for Pesach, uh, it, it started with the very first Pesach. We read in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, I usually teach on that portion. Uh, but in Exodus chapter 12, we see there uh, that Shabbat HaGadol, the great Sabbath that, that this day is commemorating, uh, is the Shabbat just before Passover, and it honors Nisan 10. Uh, can you see the scripture at the bottom right of the screen there? Let's read that together in unison. Here we go. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves. So therefore, on the tenth of Nisan, according to uh, Shemot 12.3, Exodus 12.3, uh, when the lamb uh, uh, for redemption was selected, inspected, and then finally sacrificed on the fourteenth, uh, this was the process of preparation. Uh, you say, well, what about today? Today is actually on the calendar. This is the 10th of Nisan, and certainly an appropriate way for us to understand the whole matter of our spiritual preparation. So Shabbat HaGadol reminds us uh, that without proper preparation, this was, uh, proper, it was everything to God. You say, I don't understand. What do you mean was everything to God? I thought delivering us from bondage in Egypt was everything to God. Well, uh, certainly. But doesn't it strike you as strange that on the 10th of the month, he'd want us to be preparing for a deliverance four or five days later? I mean, we might just say, get me out of Dodge now. It will take care of all that stuff much later on, okay? But no, God was not looking for a quick escape, but for a perfect redemption. And so the preparation was important to God on our behalf accordingly. And so uh, the unprepared heart and what God was doing in the Exodus to deliver us from that bondage in Egypt. So our unprepared hearts may be delaying us from the very freedom, the liberty uh, that God has in delivering us from our personal bondages. You say, what would that be? 
all the nasty habits, mental habits, the problem of anger and all the problems of resentment and all the fears that can so control us. All those things are a spiritual bondage on our souls. And God wants us to be delivered the true freedom of rejoicing in his goodness and being able to share his message with others. And so as we consider the portion before us, Yeshua intentionally teaches on this matter, and we're going to take time to study exactly what he was talking about for the application for our lives, how to prepare for the Passover, and for the redemptive freedom in him. All that Pesach was anticipating and foreshadowing. Listen carefully, if you will. When we read in the scriptures, Revelation 13, 8, it says there regarding the Messiah, that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In eternity past, this was the plan of God. And then in uh, history, what took place in Egypt was a mere rollout that was to be preparation for the fulfillment of what eternity had actually uh, determined for us. And so we want to understand how this all works together as it points us now even to our eternity uh, with God himself. And so as we consider the outline that's in your bulletin there, uh, we prepare to feast with him faithfully, verse 7 and 8, uh, to fellowship with him personally, 9 through 12. You say, where do you get this? The use of Messiah's, the use Messiah did with the word prepare. This gives us uh, an outline of thought on how he therefore taught his disciples about preparation. It'll help us as well. We prepare to fellowship with him personally, and we prepare to follow him confidently. You know, we read in the book of Revelation, uh, these follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and so we're being prepared through, for Passover, that through Passover, we'll continue following him as well. Let's get into the text, if we will. The first point, we prepare the feast with him faithfully. Verse 7 says, Then came the first day of unleavened bread, in which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And so this was a customary matter. And so even when you read that, you realize that Yeshua was involved in the life of Israel in what was being done uh, normally in all, every, every Jewish home and every, with every Jewish person as well. You say, why was he in Jerusalem? Well, everyone was in Jerusalem. Three times a year we had to go to Jerusalem uh, to worship the Lord on Passover, Shavuot, Pentecost, and on Sukkot, uh, Tabernacles. And so three times a year. So the city was filled with pilgrims. Yes, we had pilgrims first. Just want to let you pick on that. And so they came, and so this first day, they therefore recognized what was going on. I just want to make a kind of a nerdy clarification, uh, as if everything else I will say is not nerdy. You know? uh, another nerdy clarification here, uh, that this was a customary witness for him. And so as I read through the Talmud, I was reading it through it this week, uh, most Judeans, uh, people in Jude Judea, Jews were spread all over, those in Judea. And most uh, of the priestly Sadducees observed Pesach uh, at the end of Nisan 14. Uh, the Galileans, uh, certain Pharisees, and the Essenes uh, from Qumran, uh, they observed uh, Passover from the beginning of the 14th. This was customary. In fact, in the Talmud, uh, because of the nature of Passover, uh, Passover uh, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb uh, was uh, a, a sacrifice of fellowship. It was a fellowship offering uh, that was made. And so the rabbis uh, early on recognized its significance that every community develops its own customs, uh, as I was studying through Pe Pesachim 55a, also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is the way it was normally, everything was done sort of normally, from a Jewish point of view. And so Yeshua utilized Passover customs of his day to reveal himself, so also do we, as he used Passover customs to speak of the more profound truth about himself, 
So we utilize the customs in the very same way to proclaim him as the Lamb of God, Elohim. And so as we consider that matter, we want to understand what he goes on to say as he tells uh, his Talmudim, his disciples, go and prepare, go and prepare. And he gives them a command uh, to go serve him uh, in this regard. And so the whole idea of what's going on here, when we see what's happening with Passover week, because as you are aware, many of us would be aware, is that in Passover, we start with Pesach itself. We have, uh, you know, uh, hamatzot, uh, unleavened bread. Uh, and then we, call, of course, come to Rashid, the first fruits of Passover, all within the Passover week. It would start out preparing for the Passover, but with the resurrection of Messiah on the first fruits, uh, we'll be studying that next Shabbat morning, uh, the Feast of Rashid, the first fruits. And so when it starts out preparing for the Passover, it ends up preparing to go proclaim the very good news they received through Passover. And so one prepares for the other. Go and prepare the Passover, prepares them to go and proclaim the good news. One prepares for the other. If you understand the plan and the work of God, how he prepares us to move forward with him. And so preparing for Passover, uh, preparing to participate in the redemption that we so desperately need, we may not realize it. That's why God put it on the calendar, because we probably would not think about these things again. Uh, but we want to orient ourselves around these matters and be better prepared for what's coming next. And so all of this redemption that we receive, so we'll before we go and proclaim the redemption to others, uh, this is what we're all being prepared to fully do. And so our Passover preparation is, pre is preparing us for much greater service and ministry uh, to come. And when we look at the food, he says, so that we may eat it. Well, there were several things that were commanded in Scripture uh, that was necessary to eat. Uh, in uh, Shemot, in Exodus 12, uh, verse 8 and 9, it details these very things out. Uh, there had to be maror, uh, bitter herbs. How many people say, I can't wait to get to the horseradish? <laughs> oh, my. Yes, oh, I, please, hit me up. Okay. So, um, why we needed redemption, the reason why we yearn for it, because of the bitterness of bondage, because of the maror, the bitterness of bondage. And then we have uh, matzah, unleavened bread, uh, being removed, and therefore the removal of the, the leaven, the yeast, uh, the unleavened bread, uh, this has to do with the readiness for redemption. And then finally, the Zorah, we hold up the Zorah, we hold up the shank bone of a lamb uh, because we recognize the ransom for our redemption, the price that was paid. Uh, we would not have come out of Egypt except the blood of that lamb was placed on the door of the home. And so we recognize the ransom for redemption, not the readiness and the reason accordingly. And so when we think about that, uh, we want to understand, secondly, uh, preparation for the fellowship. This produces the participation. Uh, these various elements are actually placed in the scripture in order for us to understand how to participate on what God wants us to remember. You know, some of us, we forget what it was like before coming to Messiah. Uh, I've been a believer in Yeshua uh, for well over 50 years now, some of you longer, of course. But in so saying, it's easy to therefore forget what brought me to desire after Messiah, to desire after him for the salvation. I forget uh, that life without him uh, was worth, wasn't a life worth living, even though I played the game even though I kind of boasted about myself or whatever I had to do that was politically incorrect, uh, I, that I did. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is, I only came to know the real meaning, the truth, and the value of life uh, in coming to know the Messiah himself. And so this whole preparation is placed there by God in the Bible so that we would understand these matters, reorient ourselves around to our first love, because some of us left our first love because we forget how desperate we were for our salvation. 
We forget, we get distracted, we get caught up in other things. And we need to return to our first love. So Pesach, every year, reorients us around our first love, around that salvation that God had provided for us in our Messiah. When we recognize the bitterness of the bondage. When we recognize, you know, the wretchedness of our own flesh. And therefore praised him and gave him thanks uh, for the ransom, the pardon, the salvation in the Lamb of God. We praise God accordingly. And so this is what helps us to be prepared to participate. To participate in the life of God. Not a religion. We don't talk about that in our community very much at all. Uh, we, don't, we don't really give it much heed. We think of a relationship which comes about as we reorient ourselves to our first love. Uh, and Messiah brings us to that through Passover. And so, uh, read with me, if you will, about this bitter herb, if you will. Read the scripture on the right-hand side there from uh, Hebrews 12, 15. Let's go. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness bringing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So we remember the bitterness of bondage, so we remember the redemption from God. And therefore, there will not be a root of bitterness like horseradish in our soul. And some of us, and I don't want to mention names, but I may. You never know. I'm unpredictable that way. But some of us carry around bitterness, resentment, hatred, all the bitterness of bondage of sin. And therefore, it produces a root of bitterness that causes trouble, defiling of many. Uh, this is what breaks up families and breaks up relationships and everything else. And so we want to understand uh, this matter, not to come short of the grace of God in the Messiah, in what he has done. And because we all fall short of the glory of God, all of us fall short of the glory of God, therefore we must make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. And the very good news of our Messiah and the gracious love God has provided for each of us. And so now we come to the second point, uh, the second preparation, uh, when they ask him, where do you want to prepare it? Uh, to prepare for fellowship, not just to feast, uh, but to fellowship with him. Not only have our be nourished spiritually, uh, but actually to enjoy relationship with the living God. We prepare the fellowship with him personally. And so they ask them, where do you want us to prepare it? And so when we think about the issue of Yeshua the Messiah, as I head up on the screen there, one of the prophecies of the Messiah, it says in the prophet uh, Isaiah uh, 7.14 that his name would be called Emmanuel, God with us. What does that mean? God wants to have fellowship with us. The purpose of the Passover was not just to give us a good meal, uh, nourish our souls, but to have fellowship with God. God's desire is for us to have fellowship with him. All of this is so that we might have fellowship, intimacy, uh, a life worth living with the Lord God who created us. And so therefore, first of all, we see here personal fellowship seeks his intention. His in where do you want us to prepare it? You know, I imagine that some of us might think, you're a big guy, Yeshua. You know, you got to worry about the big plan. I'll take care of the details. I'll find the place, you know, I, I can handle this kind of stuff. I'm an organizer, project manager, and all of that. Uh, but no, you know, no. where do you want me, where do you want us to prepare it? Where personal fellowship seeks his intention. Your will be done. Where do you want me to live? Where do you want me to fellowship? Uh, where do you want me to serve? All of these things have to do with him. Seeking what pleases the Lord uh, is our key to personal holiness and fellowship with him. And so therefore the word where stands out to us. Uh, read with me from uh, Devarim, Deuteronomy 16.6. 6. Here we go on the left side of the screen. Here we go. But at the place where Hashem, your God, chooses to establish his name, you shall offer the Passover. When we celebrated Passover and got into the land, it wasn't wherever we wanted to celebrate it. It was where he wanted us to celebrate it, where he wanted us to be. And it turned out to be in Jerusalem, Jerusalem there. And so that is always aware, and that is vitally important. Yeshua actually taught us as much. 
He told us, as I have up on the screen for Matthew 18, 20, Yeshua said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name. That's where. In my name. I am among them. In his name. Where do you want us? In you, O Lord. In his name we gather together, B'Shem Yeshua. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. And the problem that we had as humanity is that once sin entered the human equation, once sin entered the human soul, then right away the first thing we want to do is go where we want to go. And so when God entered the, the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we see there that because of sin, we found ourselves not being where God wanted us to be. We found ourselves hiding from him as if we could. But that's what fear, that's what guilt will do to the human soul. And so God says in Genesis chapter 3, Adam, where are you? Why? Because you're not where you're supposed to be. Where's that? By me. By me. You're hiding off somewhere. God created humanity to be in relationship with him. He had Shabbat so he can have a time of fellowship with us. You say, what? Yes, even for God, Shabbat is important because it takes time to develop relationships. That's why we gather in the Lord on Shabbat because of what God wants to have for us in relationship with himself. And so are you where God wants you to be? Are you going to be in a Passover fellowship this coming week that will honor his name, the name that's above every name, the name of Yeshua? That's where God wants you to be. You say, well, isn't it just important just to be, I'll do the ceremony. Well, if you're happy with that, okay. But God is not pleased with that. God is not pleased with ceremonies. God, that, that's something that may be a substitute for what God really wants, which is a dependence or reliance, uh, an exaltation of his name. In his name. This is what makes Passover Passover. Otherwise, you're taking out the very core, the significance of it. You say, I don't understand. What do you mean? So we want to recognize what we had studied before in the fall, with the fall festivals. We had studied in Colossians chapter 2. If you remember verse 16 and 17, we talked there about not judging one another, don't judge one another about food or drink or about the annual festivals, for these are foreshadowing of things to come, and Messiah, Colossians 2 17, is the substance. He's the substance of Pesach. You don't really celebrate Pesach apart from the Messiah. That's not the way God arranged the Bible or has the festival schedule or anything else. And so we want to understand that in Messiah, that's where there is no condemnation as we studied previously. And that's where our hope lies for the future as well. And so where do you want? What is your will, O oh God? Where do you want? Where do you want me? Do where do you want me? We, we prepare to live in his will. That's what the preparation is about. To prepare to live in the will of God. Your will be done, not my will be done. I live in your will. And because I know that, therefore, you only bless your will, not my will. If I live in my will, my desires, for my preferences... Oh, all well and good, but God doesn't bless my preferences. He blesses his will according to his word. And so we want to understand that in his will, I am blessed. The will of God is not only the safest place to be, it's the most blessed place to be. And therefore, living contrary to his will is being out of fellowship with him. Personal fellowship without the joy is only in his will. For we abide in Messiah, we will therefore bear much fruit. For apart from Messiah, we can do what? Nothing. nothing. Zilch, nada, nothing. And so we want to understand being in his will. And so the disciples said, where do you want? What's your will on this matter, O oh God? And so we want to, likewise, our preparation is desiring to be in his will accordingly. And so it says there in verse uh, 10, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, follow him in the house that he enters. It seems like, why bother putting that in there? Isn't it interesting? Messiah had a plan. 
that he was ready to unfold and tell his disciples. That he had a plan ready for what to do. They probably were wondering, what are you going to do for Pastor? I don't know, you didn't tell me. I don't know, maybe, not, maybe we got to come up with our own plan. No, God has a plan for your life uh, and also for Passover, as it turns out here. And so he had the plan. He was the man with the plan. And so when they entered the city, personal fellowship trusts not only his intentions, but also his ideas when you've entered the city. Uh, in other words, you've got to act upon the truth of what God wants you to do. It's not just learning things. You know, many of us, uh, and some of us have been more mistaught, uh, and therefore we're not disciples of Messiah. We may be believers, I'm not going to judge someone's faith, but you may not be a disciple, a follower, because the difference is that we disciples act upon what he said. We actually go and enter the city. We go and do what the Bible tells us to do. That means we are followers of him. We are disciples accordingly. And so only upon following Messiah's word would they be in his perfect will. And so you say, well, what's all the secrecy? Well, he was, you know, it was a dicey time uh, for Yeshua and the Talmudim there. And so when we think about this matter, uh, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. As I studied this, and you say, you really studied how they carried things in the first century? Yes, of course I did. Why would, I, why would you do that, Sam? Because it talks about someone carrying something. And so a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. That struck me as odd. Uh, what's the big deal? I would think to be a city full of people carrying around pitchers of water, and you go in 12 different directions. It turns out that's not the way it works at all. Uh, women used to carry, use jars. Uh, men used leather skins. It was kind of a way that they handled things back in the day. And a slave is being described here, a lowly slave uh, uh, being, being, carrying uh, a, pitch, a pitcher of water. That, if it's a dude, he's a slave carrying a pitcher of water. And I myself might think, well, hold it a second. Huh. I'm not going to follow no servant. Do you know who I am? I don't go around following servants. Well, it turns out that's all I do in my life is follow a servant because Messiah is the chief servant of the Lord, you know. Messiah said he came to serve and not be served uh, and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's all we do is follow servants. And so without personal humility, there could be no spiritual unity. If you're so proud and filled up with yourself that you want to have things only on a first-class level, you know, uh, you never... You never do anything's economy class. You're always first class in whatever you do. Well, you may actually find yourself disappointed because God has called you to follow a servant, Messiah, who came to serve, not be served. We follow him, and therefore, it's in our humility we enjoy unity with him. Uh, he is one who is lowly of heart. He's the one who would talk to the poor people and hang with the poor people. Uh, he was that kind of guy. And if you're saying, well, that's not my kind of people, you say, well, who would ever think like that? There was a man who did not want to go to a congregation uh, that I sent him to uh, because he said that there were, he didn't want to be the only Cadillac in the parking lot. Out loud he said that. <laughs> how, how do people think that way? But that's what he said. Uh, and didn't want to go there. More, they didn't want to be the only Catholic. Well, some people are like that. And so we want to understand the issue that the humility is part and parcel. You say, well, how do I become humble? How do I do that? I'm going to tell you what humility is, how to be humble accordingly. If you're not writing down anything else, take note, even mental note of this. You are humble. You are expressing humility when you're placing your faith in the provision that God made for your salvation. Well, hold a second. I thought it was not thinking much of myself and not thinking about myself much. Hold it. No, it's not about you at all. It's about you trusting what God has provided. And when you do that, you're not trusting in yourself, and therefore you are humble. It's not a personality quirk. It has to do with trusting in the provision God had made. When you do that, you are humbling your soul. That's exactly what humility is in the scripture, as opposed to acting in some certain way or some pretentious 
kind of way at all, no. And so follow him. It's a command. Follow him. Do I got to? Yes, you got to. You got to follow. You got to. What? Well, why commands? I mean, that kind of bristles me. I'm not sure I like people telling me what to do. Well, understand why God puts commands in the scripture. Uh, commands are, first of all, God's priority. You know, everything in the Bible is true. But some things are put in the imperative, in the command form. You say, why does, it, why does God put some things in the imperative, in the command form? It's because these are his priorities for my life. The best way he knows for my life to be lived. And so it's his priorities for my life. And so I take them very seriously for what they are. Uh, secondly, it's not legalism, but his love, revealing his desire for us to walk with him. You say, what do you mean? His commands are his priorities. This is how he exists. And when we follow his priorities, we are walking with him. When we don't follow his priorities, his commands, his word, we are not walking with him. Because this is his will. When we say it's his will, this is what he wants to do. This is what he counts as important. And so therefore we count what he wants as important as what I want as important. And therefore, we were in fellowship, walking with him. And the commandments of God are the convictions of the saints. When the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, I don't therefore resist it saying, hold it a second, every once in a while around tax season, you know, there's got to be a little, maybe in the Hebrew it means something different, you know, or maybe like the Greek or something here, you know, get around it a little bit here, you know, my tax guy can figure out a way around, thou shalt not steal or something like that. No, no, no. When as a believer, your heart has been changed. When you come to personal faith in Yeshua, and when the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, my heart responds, I will not steal. For the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I can trust him. I don't have to steal. I can trust God. That's the difference right there. And this is what makes the difference in our life. The commandments of God are the convictions of the saints. We are people of conviction and character. And so as we prepare, you're walking with him. And I have on the screen that little picture there. Adonai's will and word, when combined with our faith and trust in him, that's where the blessings are. That's where the blessings are found. And so true followership reveals trusting fellowship. Uh, those who are in fellowship with God are following him, doing what he wants, uh, honoring him in all of their ways, trusting him, uh, trusting his will to be done. You say, how can I do that? You can't in yourself. But the Messiah came, and in him you can do all things that God called. I can do all things the Messiah who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Everything God called me to do, I can do by Messiah's power, in his grace, and all that he's provided for me in his finished work. And so, uh, trust his, at his command, not merely when I get to heaven. Right now, living for him, etc. And so we now come to what it says here, the third point about uh, preparing for fellowship. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? The teacher says to you, uh, I'm representing, as you can understand. And so personal fellowship represents his interests. The teacher says to you, uh, when I share the good news with people, I'm not sharing something I made up. I'm just a messenger boy. God wants, has good news for you. God has a message for you. Oh, did you make this up? No, I'm, can you imagine if your mail, how many people get mail delivered right to their own home? What a country. And so can you imagine if you saw, looked out your window, and there was the mailman writing a bunch of letters. But he, said from all, but he changes the names like it's from all sorts of people. Wouldn't that be weird? No, it's not the messenger that's inventing the message. No, we're just delivering his message. That's what's being seen here. And those who are being prepared are re representing his interests, representing him himself. This is what we do if we know him prepared for Passover. And so we represent him personally. Say to the owner of the house, 
Say to him personally, you speak my message to others. And so we are called to proclaim the good news in the very same way. We call to proclaim the good news. We represent him. We give God's message of salvation, not what we think religion should be about or other things. No, we don't go to the left or the right of the truth at all. We speak his message on his behalf, even speaking truth to power. And so if our government uh, ever was to do anything that's contrary to the word of God, uh, we would speak against it. And boy, do we ever. The abomination of the abortion industry, the murder of the unborn, the evil that's being perpetrated. We have a country under the judgment of God we have a country in desperate need of hearing the message that you are prepared to give. Desperately needing to hear, don't curse the darkness, light a light. Proclaim the good news of the Messiah. This is what our country desperately needs. Not the people yelling and screaming at each other, proclaiming good news that there might be revival and a change. That's the only way change is going to happen. It's not, you don't vote evil out of office. It comes with the human heart. And therefore, there needs to be a spiritual revival accordingly. So we speak truth to power. We proclaim the good news to those who are most powerful, that they will repent, that they will turn to the Lord, and therefore be empowered to lead this country to the glory of his name accordingly. And so represent his position. The teacher says to you, isn't it interesting Yeshua understood that the owner of that house would know him as the teacher. He would know Yeshua as the teacher. Uh, just like uh, his other disciples would know him uh, as the rabbi or the teacher. According, The teacher says to you, and, and, oh, what if he says, I'm sorry, there's no room in the inn. I'm the same guy from the other chapter. We still got no room. No, he, no, 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 no. If he knows Yeshua is the teacher, listen carefully, then his home is for the Lord to use. If you know Yeshua is your teacher, then your home is for his use. And if your home is not for his use, then perhaps you don't understand who he is. And maybe you therefore don't want him messing up with your little life, your little apple cart of apples put together carefully, life that you have. You're afraid he'll mess things up. He'll spoil your social life or whatever it may be. No, no, no. He wants to fulfill your life and your home. And therefore, he's not the Lord of your home. He may not be the Lord of your heart. If he's not the Lord of your home, you have to ask, is he really the Lord of my heart? Preparing for our fellowship with him. He must be the Lord of our home and therefore the Lord of our heart. Represent his purpose here. He said that I may eat the Passover with my disciples. This is what God wants. He wants to have fellowship with you. He desires redemptive fellowship with his disciples, with his followers, with his believers. He, desire, he does not want to spend eternity or Passover without you. He wants you with him. He created you on purpose, his purpose. And therefore, we are representing his purpose. And so Passover fellowship prepares us for his eternal glory, prepared now and forever accordingly. And so it says here, finally, regarding preparing for fellowship with him personally, he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. Prepare it there. And so we want to understand. Let me give you a little insight on some of my studies on this matter, what the upper room looked like. You can see on the left side of the screen, it's a, it's a tourist stop for those who've taken tours to Israel. Uh, you can see where they have the upper room. Uh, the inside on the right side of the screen, uh, it's called the Aliyah, the upper room, Aliyah. And so we want to understand what it is. Uh, but in any case, that's what it looks like. Uh, when understanding how they sat, uh, what was traditional at the time, it was uh, like a, a three-sided table. 
uh, three side the table so people who serve them can go into the middle and get everything to everywhere they need to be. But this is the way they would have sat at, a, at the Passover meal that is described in the scriptures accordingly. And when you put that, this is what it would have looked like in that particular facility. Uh, when you put that kind of table in that kind of space accordingly. And so this is just to give you an insight of what the visual uh, look at what it, what it appears like accordingly. Let's get down to the meaning for our souls, if we will, please. Uh, so personal fellowship enjoys his intimacy. The lower rooms were public and noisy. Those were public rooms, like saloons and things like that. But the upper room was a place of fellowship for privacy and intimacy. That's what the upper rooms were for. And so we can't draw near to God unless we spend some private time alone with him. When we think about what Passover is doing, we prepare for it with private time. We want to make sure we get the most out of the Passover by having private time, preparing our hearts, the upper room of our souls accordingly. Private time alone with him. And so when we think about that, uh, the importance of intimate personal fellowship uh, is going to be, of course, private. Uh, our public, when we get together every Shabbat, uh, this is always meaningful, our weekly worship together. Uh, it's honoring and meaningful. We give glory to God for it all. But it only is meaningful. It only has a purpose in your life if you're having personal, daily private worship with Yeshua. If this is the only time you're getting together for prayer, you poor dears. I don't know how you made it this far into the week. You poor things. I don't understand. No, uh, we want you to be prayed up. We want you in the word of God, living for the Lord accordingly. Then we get together in our holy huddle here and we rejoice in who God is and what he has done and can grow in him together as a community. This is what is important if preparing for the Passover accordingly. And so in the upper room, and only there are we prepared to have fellowship with the Lord, the upper room of our souls, so to speak. That's where he wants to meet with us. You say, well, what about in the public? Well, of course, of course, in the public. But let me tell you, when I am with you, I make sense. When I am alone with him, I don't always make sense. Because he knows things more deeply. I go through my yelling and screaming and groaning and moaning and all that because he can take it. You would all be shocked. I can't believe Sam is all upset about things. And why is he talking like that? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm like with him. And so, but in any case, I need that upper room ministry. I need to be with him. This is where he wants to meet with me in the depth of my own soul, in the depth of my being there. This is where life happens uh, in the spirit of the person. Uh, that's what happens, and then it impacts our soul, our intellect, our emotions, our will, and therefore we act upon it with our bodies accordingly. And so as we consider the matter, as we conclude here, uh, we prepare to follow him confidently, the last preparation here. They found everything just as he had said. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that, for you, you may not be familiar with the Bible, uh, or what, what Yeshua taught, but it's always the truth. We always find everything just as he said it would be. That's how you will live. How do you get to the future? Follow what he said, and you will be in the future what he said. God's in control now and always. And so confident in his word, uh, when they left, they had to leave, and therefore they found in order to find, you have to leave, you have to actually follow his word, and you find it all to be true. If you're waiting, you know, some people are waiting around uh, for God to do something uh, when God is saying, well, I'll do as you go ahead and follow me, as you trust in me. I will do. This is what I will do, uh, etc. I know a man who was, who was praying for a job, and I said, what are you doing looking for a job? He says, well, I pray a lot. I said, okay, what else are you doing? He said, pray a lot. I said, you went over that already. What else? He said, what do you mean? Go look for a job. Make a couple of phone calls. The, the word that God says uh, in Psalm 127 in verse 1, uh, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. In other words, we're expected to be laboring and trusting that God is giving the increase to our efforts. 
He is giving the increase to our words, to what we're doing. We're trusting him. We're following his word, living by his word. Uh, his word is the, is the guidebook for my life. This is how we know we trust him, because we follow in his word. And so as we obey the living word, then uh, this makes up the written word. Yeshua and the Bible are one and the same truth. And therefore the word can become a lamp unto my feet. Because in everything, everything, just as he has said, everything I need to be doing, God can therefore bless it in my time, my talent, my treasure, in whatever he said. And so finally, confident in his redemptive work. And they prepared the Passover. So as we come to Passover week, we want to understand Pesach, his death. Hamatzot, the unleavened bread. That's his burial. And then finally, on the third day, Rashid, first fruits, he was raised bodily from the dead, preparing to testify about his redemptive work for all humanity in Yeshua, the Messiah. And so preparing for Passover is preparing for eternity. As we celebrate our redemption lamb, we testify that we trust him with whatever we have, whoever we are. We trust him with all we are. And therefore, we follow the lamb wherever he goes. As it says in Revelation 14, 4, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These are the ones who have been purchased from among men as first fruits. Next week will be first fruits. First fruits to God and to the lamb. And so wherever he goes, I will follow. Can you say the same thing? And so are you prepared, this is the question, prepared by grace through faith, trusting in the Lord with your heart, trusting in Messiah for your redemption, your salvation, for your Passover, and therefore prepared to follow him accordingly. Uh, the congregation wants to wish you all happy Pesach, uh, Shabbat Hagadol Mevorach, have a blessed great Shabbat today, and may the Lord bless you accordingly. Let's prepare in prayer right now. Uh, if you're a visitor here, we close our eyes to concentrate in prayer, but we open our hearts to God. If you're here uh, and you need to be prepared, you need to trust in the Messiah, come to him. Just come to him right now. As simple as that. I'm going to close with a simple prayer. If this prayer reflects the deed of your heart, just pray it with me. Not that the prayer will prepare you, but it'll place your faith on Yeshua. That's what makes a difference. So in your heart, God hears your heart. Let's pray together as a community. Dear God, forgive me of all my sins so I will be prepared for Passover and for life with you forever. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen.